Morning, lads. Hey, Ryan, all right? Morning, Ryan. Ryan. How are you, mate? All right? Yeah, Looking good. tired there, mate. <laughs> well, it's the joys of having three kids under nine in lockdown, isn't it? I thought, I thought you had a little bit on endurance-wise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, did, I have done a, a, a little Zwift. I set up a team Zwift with some of the staff this morning, yeah. so I've already, already got that in the bag. But, uh, yeah, I've I'm, I'm, I'm actually been doing a lot since that bloody run. <laughs> That's not surprising, really. <laughs> well, Fraser, last time I got FaceTimed by someone in bed, it cost me about £15 a minute. <laughs> they, weren't as, about... they weren't as close. As... No, I'm joking. We're recording, aren't we? So we've got to keep it clean. <laughs> that's, that's about Finton's rates anyway, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies if my daughter's dipping in and out as well. Uh, She's running. My youngest is running in and yeah, out. Yeah, mine will be in at some point, mate. Don't worry about that. Yeah, no Fraser's, uh, Fraser's daughter normally makes an appearance. Uh, I've got teenage boys and one who's 20, so they're not up till about one o'clock. So, uh... They're not, in, not interested in the slightest. <laughs> right. All right, so uh, welcome to the uh, FFS podcast, number nine. And uh, absolutely delighted this morning that we've got uh, Ryan Jones with us. Now, uh, in a time, obviously, we're all stuck in lockdown at the moment, and we're seeing on social media people are posting their past sort of uh, sporting careers and old photos and things like that. Well, uh, I think Ryan's got one of uh, one of the most impressive portfolios in uh, in Welsh rugby. So uh, fair play. Sometimes we just have to remind ourselves, right? So I'm not going to embarrass you, but obviously I'm going to give you an introduction of uh, uh, obviously Welsh captain. Uh, one of only seven players, if I'm right, who's won three yeah. triple crowns. Sorry, three uh, Grand Slams. Three Grand Slams, yeah. Three, three yeah. Grand Slams. Seven. One as captain there. Uh, it was yeah. one as captain, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 70 odd t- f- uh, times for Wales. He's a uh, British Lion. Uh, numerous uh, awards with the Ospreys as well. He was Wales' most capped captain uh, until sort of Sam Warburton overtook him recently. So, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> your portfolio, uh, I mean, we could spend all day talking about all of that, but uh, it is quite impressive. Uh, my sort of memories of you as uh, going back to the playing days, I just always seem to have this vision of you running up the pitch in Scotland, against Scotland uh, for, for that try. I'm sure you remember that. Uh, yeah, I, was, I, was, I wasn't really renowned for my prolific try scoring, Fint. You know, that being <laughs> one of only two tries in 75 tests I scored for Wales. Um, the second one being from about a yard and a half against Australia. So, um, but they all count, I suppose. They do. And uh, I think my other vision of you is uh, arriving on tour in New Zealand in 2005 and uh, that stormer you had uh, just carrying like uh, like a madman really uh, in, in that uh, game I think against Otago is it? Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. look it's, it's, it's really it's, I'm, I'm always sort of flattered and humble when I hear people speak about it and you know I'm sort of five years post playing now and um, you know it, it, it's almost as if it happened to someone else it's really strange you know it's part of my life that you know, I, I really treasure and you know I look back on it with with amazement really because when I, when I set out on it I never in a million years thought I'd achieve half of what I did you know I'm, I don't I don't profess to be even that good at rugby I was just incredibly competitive and, and worked really hard you know and I was also really fortunate I think the time I played you know I, I yeah, it kept myself really lucky to have shared the field with you know people who I think will be revered as some of the greatest players Wales have ever seen right from the Gareth Thomases through the Alan Jones and People like Shane and Nugget and all that in between, you know, Warby and Toby, um, Ken Owen, Smiler, Adam Jones, Mike Phillips. The list just goes on and on and on, you know. And I'm, you know, kind of myself really fortunate because I could have been born in a different era and <laughs> circumstances could have been really different. But uh, no, it's been a, it really has been. A, well, it was a magic sort of 13, 14 years, really. I mean, it's interesting you say that, Ryan, because your upbringing in rugby, well, in the game, probably was. But different to what people would realise, wasn't it? You know, I've just read Sam Warburton's book, for example, who was ushered into rugby by the age six, seven, eight, and then, you know, by the time he left primary school, it was all he wanted to do. You were a late comer, weren't you? In fact, I'd say football was your first love and your first dream as well. Yeah, it, it, 
you, you're right, you know, and I, um, I keep kind of, I've, I've always sporty, you know, and I'm very fortunate that my parents always sort of encourage and support me to do a, a raft of all sorts of different things, you know, so tennis was my first passion, actually, you know, I was a huge tennis fan and, you know, but, you know, I was brought up in Newport in, in East Wales, not the, not the posh nice one down west, and, um, um, you know, t- tennis back in the sort of 80s was a, a, not necessarily an accessible pastime for for families like I was and, and and obviously the time the commitment you know of training before school and after school and it just didn't quite work out and I uh, then I went to football you know as, as most kids do you know it, it sort of had a, had a journey that way my I'm from a rugby family I'd say my dad was an avid rugby um player and, and fan in it in, throughout his life um career policeman then so you know he didn't didn't play later on in life but you know I came into rugby at sort of 15 well 16 17 played obviously in school in PE lessons as everyone does but you know I joined my local rugby club at, uh, and the and the 17s because after my football career had come to an end Bristol City had said I wasn't quite gonna gonna cut it, it was in the days of the sort of YTS and apprenticeship type era um you got Bristol City as a goalkeeper is that right yeah I was, I was a goalkeeper so you know that's where tall fat kids tend to end up when they're when they're younger um so, you know, they, they told me that I was even too fat, lazy and slow for, for football. So, you know, I naturally fell into rugby, which <laughs> they're attributes to be celebrated, I suppose, um, back then anyway. Uh, so, I, so I took up, you know, sort of local village village rugby then, in my local uh, club, Risker, um, just because that's where all my school peers went. Um, and sort of fell in fell in love with the, playing the game then. Um, you know, my journey sort of accelerated from there. You know, I had the junior representative honours and 18s, 19s, 20s. Um, then you know, Newport released me at uh, 20 years of age. I sort of said I wasn't quite going to cut it there. Um, and then I went to play for Bridge End, which was the old Welsh Premiership. And then it went regional. Um, signed for the Warriors. And then I'd sort of 11 years, and it was at my, at the Ospreys, which is, which is my, my, my home and club, really. So... Yeah, that's a whistle did, stop of my of my career. Do you think it helped you starting late, Ryan? And I say that because you know, there's a lot of mini and junior rugby about now for kids, and it, it's great in some ways. You know, you go down St David's in St David's Rugby Club on a Sunday morning, the car park's full. You know, there's parents lining the touchlines. A far bigger crowd there than there is for any senior game. But you know, those are kids who are starting out at six, seven, eight years old. Maybe by the time they get to seventeen, eighteen, they they've maybe had enough of rugby or if not had enough they've experienced other things their interests have, have maybe got, got dwindled or their focus has gone elsewhere but in your case you were coming in at 17 18 so there was no chance of you being maybe you know sick of the game or you know you hadn't had enough of it you hadn't had it drilled into you since you were a youngster and even then at 19 20 like you were saying released by Newport the whole idea the whole game was still quite fresh to you did that help yeah I, I, think, I think there's lots in there actually um one is around, and I, and I live it now, as I, as I, as I, know, I know both of you do, that, that, that there is so much more accessible to kids these days. So, you know, within five miles of our doorstep, my, I've got, I'm very fortunate to have three, three children, boy and two girls, between the ages of five and nine, with, within five miles of our doorstep, they can do anything they've seen on television. You know, you, they play fr- you know, competitive frisbee on the front of Swans, you know, right through to all your traditional mainstream sports. And, you know, with the, with the likes of the internet and TV, um, kids have access to and, uh, and are motivated and inspired to do lots of different things, which is wonderful. You know, we live on the coast like, like, like you do as well, you know, and you, you've got all those coastal sports and pastimes to, to take part in. And I, and I think it's, I think more and more evidence is telling us now that elite sports, men and women, uh, are usually good all round sports people, you know, so they've got, there are an awful lot of transferable skills, um, um, between sports these days that the nature of athleticism is changing so you know kids undoubtedly benefit from sp- cross sport transfer you know the, the notion of sort of burning kids out I think is dependent on the, the child the family the circumstances some people are genuinely rugby people and you know like Warby will we, we, you know we're always immersed in, in rugby you know that wasn't me I took a slightly different pathway but all the evidence sort of lends itself now that more and more children will follow that you know we we're a consumer-led uh, population now as well we 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 flip from fad to fad it, we all we want gratification right now you know so you'll you'll tr- my kids are great they'll try something if they're not good at it they want to go and do something else you know when 
trying to give them that uh, sort of you know you want to stay and work at things is, is difficult um but i you know person personally i'm a big believer in that in that journey because that was my journey that's my experience so you know i try i'm big advocate and trying to give my kids a well-rounded sport in because you know um hand-eye coordination hand-eye coordination good good physical movement is good physical movement strength you know i, I you know my, my dad was, was great you know at 16 17 18 i had a weightlifting coach you know so to teach me not not to be big and strong but how to lift properly you know and it, they're things that stood me in good stead later on in in my career really and i think sometimes you can for, you can follow you can follow quite insular pathway that doesn't always work for some and it's a well-trodden um phenomenon now you look at your likes of liam williams um aaron wainwright you know these guys didn't follow linear pathways to sport you know the, this notion of you pick up a rugby ball at six and you do nothing else until you reach the principality stadium is highly unlikely these days and not necessarily actively encouraged i think the challenge for all sports is to facilitate kids to dip in and out and try other things and avoid clashes because the, the biggest threat we all face as a society is in inactivity you know as, as, as you will know so it's pointless your mainstream sports fighting over existing population we've got to find a way to allow those to to to, to sort of flip between sports if you like flip in and out because good footballers make good rugby players good rugby players often make good footballers and, and vice versa um, but likewise we've got to find a way of where a kid engages in activity in sport has a damn good time because then they'll stay active you know that's that's our biggest big, biggest challenge i think yeah that's uh, it's quite interesting you say that and uh, obviously we'll go back to uh, a word you mentioned here a bit later uh, competitiveness because uh, you know i think that uh, would be used to uh, to describe you but you know you, you talk about talk about your sort of past achievements so you say uh, you know it's, it seems like someone else now but you go back to i think it's 2008 you and shane williams were named as uh, you know world players of the year in in the uh, in the, the nominations weren't you your first welsh players for a long time unfortunately uh, you know shane just edged it over you but uh, I, I, I think the only reason they, i think the only reason they picked me is they knew welsh welsh guys don't like to travel on their own to london so someone had to keep shane company on, on the train <laughs> but you know but if you look back at that like, you think both of you two have uh, you know come into sp the sport of rugby late wasn't it you know shane yeah. you know which is gymnastics played a lot of football uh, yeah. you know came into rugby late and uh, and obviously you with tennis football things like all oh, it's going to improve your high hand coordination your spatial awareness and you know i think there's definitely something in uh, in having a rounded uh, rounded upbringing really and just learning from all these different sort of uh, sports and traits but even from um you know, but you, you notice it when you're in the environment. So, Gethin Jenkins is a really good footballer, you know. Dan Bigger is a really good golfer and footballer. Gav Ensign is a fantastic all-round sportsman, you know. Shane's a good all-round, you know. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Thomas, fantastic cricketer, you know. There's like, there's, you, you often see, you know, I was just watching, uh, as, as I'm sure we all are, the, the Michael Jordan documentary now, you know. He's a, he's a fantastic golfer, you know, and huge competitor you know so and this is repeated you know gareth bale is a, is, is, is a yeah. golfer first and then a footballer isn't he? you know like the, the boys are you know not just competitive and and, and, and the girls see with the girls as well you know you've got you've got some fantastic tennis players in 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 and around you've got jack jazz who's a fantastic athlete you know yeah. you no know, featured you know they're, they're transferable skills between between sport you know and, and all the attributes that come with it your, your product your environment your experiences on you i just think that the more rounded and experiences you can give youngsters in those influential years the better skill set you can give them um is a huge advocate i'm a bit of a sort of really interested on this kids are kids are fantastic i think the, the watch is we always over coach them you know because you 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 impart your experiences on them and, and i i remember reading um well, bear with me a second, this is a long story short, but I, I was reading, reading an article around um, skill acquisition for kids, right? Because in my old job, I was responsible for the community side of, of rugby. Um, and, it, and it talked around how kids kids copy um, and actually trial and error is the best way for skill development. That's what they hypothesized, right? So I, I came home and we're not, we're not cricketers, right? So it's probably the one sport that doesn't really feature, you know, we don't watch it, you know, we don't go cricket club or anything. So I thought, 
so I got a set of stumps, I got a bat and a ball, and I took my boy out in the garden and just said, right, we're going to play cricket. Now, pretty sure he's never seen it, never watched it. Showed him once how to hold the bat. I reckon within 10, 15 throws, he knew where to stand, how to hold the bat, how to hit the ball out of the garden, you know. And he sort of was a bit of a lesson for me that actually discovery for kids you know, because that, that was my journey. You know, I took a all rounded path, and I dipped in and out of different things. And you know, I learned. No, no one, no one's, no one ever taught me how to catch a rugby ball. No one ever taught me how to pass it. No one ever taught me how to kick it. You know, I don't even think I was ever really coached to tackle. You know, until later on in my career, things like that. You know, and it it sort of hit home for me that actually, you know, that trial now is really important because I think there's some really good skill acquisition in it because. What works for me might not work for you, Fint, might not work for you, Free. You've got to, you, you have to find your own, your own style. And I think sometimes we sort of limit people's ability by putting our own, and we'll talk about this a, a bit later, but we put our own preconceived ideas and our own faults and techniques onto, onto others. Right, I, I think it's really interesting. I completely agree with everything you said there. And I, it, it intrigues me now that, going what you said there, we, looking at rugby, how do we keep that? That ethos alive in rugby now because obviously from when you came into the game and certainly from when you know me and Finn were growing up as well it's a very much a different system um rugby is a lot more professional talent is identified a lot earlier you know the, the youngsters now they're going into regional academy systems at a lot younger age than say 17 when you really started playing for example and the the training and the build up towards them hopefully becoming professionals is a lot more intense, isn't it? And I get that side too, because rugby is a lot more physical game now. Um, there's a lot more emphasis on strength and conditioning. And by the time these, these youngsters are, are growing into men or women or 18, 19, they need to be physically ready. So I do understand why, why it's a more intense process and why talent has to be identified early and that sort of thing. But how do we do that and keep the ethos of what you've just talked about there, allowing them to, to broaden their experience, to have a wide range of sport as well at the same time? Well, then the daring is the magic, is, 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 the, is, the, is the question. I, I don't, I'm not convinced there's a sport out there that's re really done it, you know. The undoubtedly, sort of talent identification systems and, you know, academies cater for the majority, you know, there's, is, or, or, or certainly is, is one avenue to it. Um, you know, everyone's petrified of sort of missing talent if you like and there's a there tends to be an urgency to progress talent through the system to to get the final product as quick as as quick as you can a lot of it is circumstance driven um but we've also got they also a pinch of reality as well you know there are only what circa 200 professional male rugby players in wales yeah. you know across the four regions and there are well tens of thousands of of, of young young men and boys playing between the ages of under under eight right up to, to senior men you know the chances of 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 actually getting there are, are, are pretty pretty stacked against you really aren't they you know this is an element of that um and again it's you've got to create a system that uh, eventually allows people to come in and out of it because what you can't close to your point what you can't do is close off the system at 16 years of age you know one thing that is well evidence is our our sport is a late maturation sport really um both through physical and skill development you know and identifying talent that you know at a young age is nigh on impossible you know um i'm a big advocate for for not coaching kids to win coaching them to play the game the, the right way and develop skill and uh, uh, and the like but you know that's a philosophical debate that we all have we've all come we've all you know i stand on a on a touchline on a Sunday afternoon and we all come up against a whole variety of coaches and, and players and you know we've all been on the receiving end of give it to the big kid who runs over everyone else and the team wins by 30 points when no one else touches the ball you know and but likewise you've got to keep kids engaged you know and I think that that's the biggest that's the biggest challenge and that's success for any coach you know if you've got the same 30 kids at 16 that started at under seven you've you know that's a sign of a of a, of a good club and a, a good coach really I suppose but again it, <coughs> this is just an opinion of opinion of one you know we can talk about this and argue about this till the, till the cows yeah, yeah. won't come you know so but you're right there comes there comes a point where um you know it does it does become performance based undoubtedly um and likewise the the preparation of that like the guys the guys are conditioned now they they, they are they're rugby athletes now you know there's no there's no doubt in that you know you see the time and effort that goes into physical um, mental prep is 
is is up there with any, with anyone in the world. Is what we're going through now actually interestingly. So, you know, one of the big big conversations out there right now is you know, we're all talking around sport coming back online at some point. I don't know in the late summer, early early autumn, as it were. But actually, how long is it going to take to condition these guys to get back up to? Because it's not just a case of turning back on the tap on Monday and the guys can play Saturday. You know, these are hundred kilo plus athletes who travel really fast now. Um, we've got to make sure from a from a welfare point of view they they're ready to go. Yeah. I I mean obviously uh, you know you do practice what you preach when you talk about the kids stuff because I've seen you uh, down in uh, St David so you've brought your mumble side down a few times and uh, uh, I mean, what a coaching staff to turn up with Mumbles, with uh, Ryan Jones and James Hook, like you're with the under, <laughs> the under nines. <laughs> but uh, what I was really impressed with when I was watching that is, uh, you know, as, as you say, you see on a Sunday all sorts of different types of coaches coaching kids' sport, and they've all got different opinions of if it's win at all costs or fun or whatever. But you had you two guys there, and you virtually didn't know you two were there. You were so quiet. You just let them play. You know, you did a bit of ref in there. And uh, and I remember speaking to you about the games before they started. And it was very, very laid back and such a good a good thing for, for the kids. I mean, they, they just want to have fun, don't they? they? You know, they don't, you know, they don't even care. Once the game's over and they've had their ice cream or, or their sausage yeah. and chips or they, they just think of the next thing, ain't they? And it is all about fun. And... You know, you do practice what you preach there. I've got to say, like, you know, it's a uh, who's yeah, really you know, often have the debate about kids want, yeah, kids want to be competitive, undoubtedly. You know, it's one of the oldest things in the world. You know, the first thing my boy wanted to do was he, when he could walk was race me in the garden on a run. You know, that's what that's what we do, you know. And the girls, and I know my daughters, and well, my eldest daughter's probably the worst of the lot. She's got dad's competitive genes, but but you're right in the fact that. They want to be competitive when it's appropriate, you know, and that's what we sort of try to instill in the kids. Yeah, be, be competitive, but it's not not a, not at all cost because actually they just want to have fun, you know. They want an appropriate level of competition. They want to be competitive. They want to feel like they've tried hard, but actually they just want to have fun with their mates. So, you know, if my boy will talk, you know, I had more fun playing in the trees and scoring, you know, diving tries and stuff like that than than he does. How many, how many games do you remember that you lost at under nines and eights and tens? You really don't, do you? You, know, this was, no. you, you remember having a damn good time at the rugby club or yeah. you know, you remember all your mates that you, know, you used to do different things with and, and, and I think that's really important, you know, um, yeah. just to have a really positive experience. We, you know, and I do that with the kids with, you know, they do lifeguards and, you know, they, they do football, you know, yeah. and just want them to have a really positive ex experience of it, you know. Because it doesn't, let's, let's be fair, none of it matters. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was saying that to uh, to my son, now 20, yesterday, who painted the house. And we were talking about all the, you know, kids rugby and everything. And how when I was coaching them, you thought it was the end of the world. And you'd want to do this and want to do that. And now you look back, you think, it just... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just want to, I just, you know, it po positive for me is that, yeah. you know, him and the, and the two girls just... Just love the game, and it's something that we can share for yeah. until they put me in a box, you know. If, if that if that means any of them going on to having some sport and success, great. If it doesn't, well, you know, we hopefully we just share a passion for for stuff, you know. Yeah, and that's and that is it. Is this is just sharing that time when they're growing up? I mean, at the moment, uh, we've got a bit more time to share with them, haven't we? We're uh, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're we're stuck in this lockdown. Uh, and you know, I was going to ask you what you've been doing to keep busy, like you. <laughs> oh, crikey! So yeah, it's been um, it's been interesting, isn't it? Like like everyone else, I'm probably probably well, maybe not like everyone else, but I, I am struggling. I've certainly worked out I'm not cut out for prison life. Um, that wouldn't suit me at all. Um, I'm not enjoying the sort of the perceived restriction, if you like, you know, because I live fairly rurally and very lucky that. You got the coast and different things, but it's it's you know just the isolation nature. I'm quite a quite a social animal as, as we all are on the call, you know, and it's you know that human interaction is 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 quite important. And likewise, you know, I, I probably a little bit goal orientated as well. I like different things, and I, you know, I have a few things in mind this year, a few challenges and stuff I wanted to do. But you know, what with sort of juggling work, which is interesting. So I, you know, manage the sort of 
uh, the performance side of, of the Welsh rugby union, you know, or, or, or all the all the performance rugby that underpins a national squad, if you like. So you know, and the, and the teams associated with that. So there's lots going on in that space. So that's a that's a bit of a moving feast at the moment because as every day goes by and every update comes out of government, the, you know, the the riverbanks for that are, are changing. Likewise, trying to juggle family life. Um, again, homeschooling, and you know, the kids the kids have had enough as well now. You know, they they're feeling it and arguing with every, each other and fighting and squabbling and bored of dad and all that sort of stuff. So we're doing that. But, you know, in and amongst that, probably something I've realised quite early on is that I'm probably relatively selfish and, you know, I, it's, and not, not in a negative way, but there's certain things that I really enjoy doing and, and I, love, I love pushing myself. Um, something I sort of, I don't, I don't like being confined or constrained by by others you know so i think we're all we're all to a greater or lesser extent you know live our lives by fear of failure or you know the negative constraints so you can't do that or we can't do that well actually i love the question why you know i think it's the, the best question in the world and i think you know the more the more we ask that of ourselves and each other i think we we find out a lot more but rugby taught me really early on that we're all capable of so much more you know i i was I had a wonderful career, but you know, 2007, I was told to retire because I've had some pretty major shoulder ops, and there's nothing more they could do for me. But I, but I very much found a way, you know. So, you know, it was, it was eight years later that you know I retired, and boy, am I glad I didn't give up at 2007. Because I wouldn't have gone on to achieve mm. half of what I did. So, in amongst that, I'm always driven by this sort of thought and this this drive that. Actually, if if you think you can, you can. You know, no, nothing's nothing's really impossible because someone will go and do it eventually. And and you know, follow, following rugby, <laughs> 2015, uh, I had another shoulder injury, and again, I had another shoulder up. And at sort of 35 years of age, enough enough was enough. So um, I remember going to see the surgeon who done all three ops on me in his house. He invited me round, and you said, "Look, Ryan, and, and you know, sort of enough's enough." Um, you know, you, you can't, you can't, you can't keep doing this to your body, or it's going to really not going to end well. So on that, you know, we after some tears and some discussion, as the words up, you know, we had the conversation. What does that really mean? So you know, what what can I do? You know, I'd seen sort of, I I fallen in love with it a little bit with cycling along the back end of my career, as all middle aged men do. <laughs> um, and you know, I a man who was starting to pick up in. Tembi and all that type of stuff was on my radar. So I said to the surgeon, well, you know, given given the fact that I've had both my knees done, I've got pins and plates in my one leg and I've had my shoulder done, what you know, what does what does future activity look like? Because I knew it's knew it's really important to me. He said, Well, you know, I wouldn't swim any long distances. Um, cycling might be okay, and I certainly wouldn't do any running. So on the on the back of that, I said, Well, this time next year I'm gonna do Ironman. And that was basically how it started, really. So and and that that journey was a really sort of interesting, powerful one for me because what I did discover on that is that on the back of I think it was about eleven and a half weeks training, um, you know I, I managed to I managed to complete Ironman in sort of twelve and just under twelve and a half hours, and I realised that actually, you know, you, you your body will overcome anything you, you you put to it. You know, so I'm fascinated now by actually what 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 you're capable of. I've, you know, I learned a long time ago. Yeah your mind will give up before your body will, you know, and you just need to, you just need to find a way. Ryan, do these, these Ironman events and, and the other endurance, cha endurance challenges you do, do they help fill a void? And I, I'll just explain what I mean by that now. I, I work on Ironman every year and it's no coincidence to see a growing trend of, of Welsh rugby players who are competing. They've had yourself, Shane Williams, Ian Goff, Gareth Thomas, Andy Moore, even you know, the, the prop now in Crimmick, John Davis has, has done a couple himself. And obviously when rugby you know, in the last 10, 20 years, it's becoming so much more intense and professional, the day-to-day -day work you have to go through. And then when you retire, I imagine in some cases, there may be a bit of relief um, originally, especially if, like in your case, it was injury-related and a chance to give your body a rest. But then it's only so long, isn't it, that, you know, you can keep your competitive instincts and your, your competitive nature down, so to speak. Does moving on to this, does that help fill the void left by, by rugby? Yeah, I'm probably going to touch on some personal stuff here. I, I'm not afraid to say that I, I still sp speak to someone now about it because 
I, I don't think you ever can replace replace it um, in, in lots of ways, really. So for probably the best part of 13, 14 years of, of life, you, you, you institutionalize, if you like, you know. So mm-hmm. you've, got the, you've, got the, you've got the practical, logistical side of pro sport. So, you know, I was told where to be, what time, what to wear, what to eat, how to behave. Yeah. Um, it dictated summer holidays, pastimes, Christmases. For, for a large chunk of my sort of informative years, you know, I'm the first of a generation really that actually knew nothing else other than pro sport, you know, and I would argue that we probably didn't have the level of care or or or, or, or prep for, for life after sport either, you know, and that's been that's been an interesting an interesting journey. You know, with regard to the the void, it's you know, I I, I still to this day think there's sort of several people who live in this in this body if you like you know so as i said i was never i was never the most gifted sportsman um but i was in, i was incredibly competitive and you know and i just found a will to and a and a way to to be competitive you know some days it went well some days it didn't but you know i always sort of tried my best you know and that and that and that's probably the part of my sort of um challenge if you like that is how to how to feed that side of of life and personality you know plus all the you know over the course of over a period of time you 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 learn to sort of reintegrate into into normality if you like so that you know and you know i like to think that i took a sensible approach and you know i I knew rugby was going to come to an end so 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 did sort of professionally prepare to finish but emotionally i you know Probably never got the same I could buy either, you know. So the last time I walked off the pitch with was was with a physio and an arm and a sling, and and that was mm-hmm. it. And I think that I think that still haunts me a bit because I never got the treasure, you know, turning up at the ground, all that all that type of stuff. And you know that that that's hard with regard to all the events. It's, it's really interesting because you know, and I don't I don't mean this to sort of be little anyone else's journey or anything, like that, but. But ironically, I, I often don't get a huge amount of satisfaction, satisfaction for completing because because when you when you're almost like a a process driven individual, if you like, or you know, I I, I never for one minute think I'm not I'm not going to complete it. Um, and when you complete it, it's it's it, it's just it's just a phase of of the journey, if that makes sense. There's no there's there was no jubilation because I never thought. I wasn't, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, you just draw a line onto it. It's almost that sort of week to week match mentality or campaign to campaign. You, you had a plan, you executed it as you always do. And that, and that's it, you know, there's, and there's probably this part of me and that's why the sort of things I've done have probably got slightly more progressive in, I don't know, perceived difficulty, I suppose, um, you know, to, cause I'm, I want, probably want to get as close to the limit as I as I possibly can. You know, I almost want to. Cause I'm not. I'm not. I'm not driven by fear of failure. You know, failure for me would probably mean that you know I've, I've tapped out and something's beat me. You know, I'd prob- probably then go back and have another crack at it. But you know, it's searching that. Um, you know, that's why over the course of the last few weeks, you know, I did a did a did a marathon in my garden, which is only I haven't got a twenty six point two mile garden. I hasten to add, I've got a so it was sort of 700 lengths of a 30 meter garden. Um, and I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm not conditioned for it. I'm, you know, I'm not really, in, not, not that light at the moment, 110 kgs and it's, it's quite heavy for a endurance athlete. And that was a, that was a bit of a challenge, but you know, we got through that. I did a hundred mile on static, which was, which was awesome with to raise some money. And, and, and then last week I did a hundred mile on a, on a treadmill, which is, really is up there on the quite quite the extreme end of, yeah. <laughs> of of fundraising as it were but and and in that as well I did, what i did take a lot of satisfaction of is you know i, I do like i've I, you know I've, using my profile or what little profile i've got left to, to try and do some good you know or you know, yeah. and what's been amazing with this with all this stuff is sort of inspiring others and I, i'm not not inspiring them to go and run and try and run 100 mile or go and do an iron man or go and do anything else it's just actually you know, if I can think outside the box and push myself to my limit, you know, you, 
someone else's. My sister ran on the back of it. My sister run, has run three and a half miles this week for the first time ever, you know. So, and that, that's her upper limit. And that's great, you know. So, mm-hmm. I just think. I just think we're all capable of so much, so much more. You know, we just put these self-limiting, we have these self-limiting beliefs all the time. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Sorry, yeah. that's a really long answer to your question. No, that's a really... No, it's an interesting that's one. A, that's a really good answer, isn't it? I, I, was, I mean, you sort of answered a few of the points I was going to sort of say there because when I've spoken to you in the past about sort of Ironman and triathlon and, and things like that, and as much as you sort of enjoyed doing it you, you you weren't really in it to race it yourself like you, you had no sort of ambition to go back and think oh, i can go 10 minutes quicker next year you know i got the impression that you wanted to push your body uh as much you wanted to start something that you don't know if you can actually finish it yeah yeah you, you, you're spot on um you know so i, I was going to do sort of two two i was do do two Ironman this year. I was going to do Spain and obviously in in for, in for Wales again. Being in the tenth year, you know, I, I'm not really, you know, I'm not driven to beat my PBs or anything. Like that. It's just, you know, it'll be me versus me on the day, and I'm quite comfortable with that. But it was more a, a stepping stone to sort of next year, you know, because what I've got, I've got no, I've got no ambition to repeat, you know, to yeah. do Ironman year after year after year to go five minutes quicker, ten minutes quicker, twenty minutes quicker, you know, because. I'm not. I'm not a triathlete. You know, I'm not a. I'm not an Ironman. I've got. No, I've got no aspirations to prove or or compete. If you like, you know, I just want to be the best Ironman that I can be on the day. Likewise, if I turn up and do a running event, I want to be the best runner that I can be on on that day. You know, so. But what I'm what I am chasing is that push thing. The push really stretch and push me emotionally, physically. You know, time and time again. You know, that's that's the bit I. The bit I miss, I suppose, you know, and um, nice. looking looking for the you know, I, I coined the phrase with the with some of the staff, which sort of makes it work, you know. What's what's your next Everest? So all I'm ever looking is conquer one, and what's next, you know, and what's next, and and what's next. Um, but given the limitations that we've all got, you know, so yeah. I, you know, what I, is I, your next one? Out of interest, <laughs> right? Uh, well, I. There's three things I'd love to, I, I would love to have a crack at. Um, I'm not sure if now is the time to check it out publicly. I, I would love, to, I, I've always thought about, I'd, I'd love to run around Wales. So you've got the 919 mile, I think it is around the coastal path and up the centre. And I'd love to, I'd love to have a crack at, at running that. I've also got this notion of I'd love to run from the northern most point of Wales to the southern, um, taking in the Welsh Three Peaks as well. So that's, that would be that would be up there, um, and then you know I will probably would like to have a, a crack at. I, I, I do want to do a good Ironman, you know. I do. Would, I just want to be the best Ironman I can be. But I'm also fully aware of the constraints we all live. You know, there's going to have to be timing right with work and different things like that because I understand that unless you know unless you can commit 15 hours a week consistently for six months, I'm probably not going to be the best Ironman that I can be. But you know, I'd be the best Ironman I can be on that day, which is which is great. But actually, how how good could you be? Well, you don't don't really know. Yeah, some good challenges there. I uh, I fancy <laughs> the uh, the around Wales and the Three Peaks. When I'd be looking at that, uh, that that'd be uh, that'd yeah. be a good one. Just an adventure, mate. Isn't it? Yeah. Because all exactly. it, look, we're we're all storytellers. You know, that's all we want, right? So all we want is when it's all said and done. You know, what, what's your story? You know, then for, for me, this is just a, you know, all these things I do are, are just another pages in, in, in my book, really, you know, that sort of def- define me, you know, I think it's me living my life as me, if that makes sort of sense. Just going to go in there, right? Just uh, obviously what you were saying about, uh, you know, the challenges, you know, and inspiring people. And I've got to say, like, you know, we, we obviously put on events and, in the last five, six years, I haven't managed to do anything myself because I've just been so busy doing events for other people. And, you know, the, the gratification you get is people saying, oh, you're inspiring me, you've made me do this, made me do that. And, uh, you know, and, and you do get a pleasure out of that. It is, you know, it's why you do it. But on, in this lockdown, you know, I was, you know, not working. I'm thinking, right, what am I doing? And I saw, you know, you were doing that marathon in your garden. And I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. And I'd really, 
you know, my garden's about 15 metres, so it would have been a hundred and, you know, 1,400 uh, laps of it. But I was thinking to myself, oh, I, I just, could I do it? Could I? And I thought I could do it, but I, I didn't sort of, I was going to message you and say, look, I'll join in and do that with you. But then when you came and, and, <laughs> and did the, uh, the bike, the static bike, the 100 miler, I thought, right, I haven't cycled for ages, but I'm definitely going to do that. And, uh, and that was a great day. And and since then, I have you know I did the Shane was it Shane did a bike ride yeah, well for a yeah, week. Yeah. I did I did half of that. Okay, have you in there? Right, call in, call in. And Annie, bring it, Annie. Bring it, bring it back in here if you want. Sorry, sorry. Right. Uh, All we'll being there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was uh, you know that that sort of. And that's inspired me to, I mean, I'm training like more than I've ever trained anything now. And, uh, and then when you, you did the 100 mile on the treadmill, you said, do that. I mean, I haven't got a treadmill, luckily. But I mean, that, that is one thing that I thought, you know, that's, that is something else that is. Uh, yeah, it was, it, I've got to be honest, it was, it was epic. Of all the things I've done, I, I sort of, I really enjoyed it, you know, and it, the two the two weeks and the run up to it because I did the did the garden marathon which probably it, it was really interesting so we we we're, again like so we've all got self limiting beliefs right so we're all too busy aren't we or we're all not fit and therefore so oh that's too far or you know I'm a little tight you know we, these are all these are all stories we tell ourselves you know the reality is. You have got enough time if you chose to get up at five o'clock in the morning, but you've got to want to do it, and you, you know, you, we, or you prioritise it over other stuff. I think the one thing this, this sort of lockdown has taught me is that I, was, I think a lot of time I was a really busy fool. You know, I spent an awful, lot, awful lot of time doing stuff, um, and actually, when you boil it all down, probably didn't didn't enjoy a lot of it, and none of it, none of it really matters. You know, whereas, so so there's a sort of purity if you like to the last couple of weeks so and you know i realized that actually doing challenges and, and doing doing stuff for me is really important you know so um i've i've, en I've enjoyed i've enjoyed that um it, on, on top of that i think the the two weeks running up to it, it go back to your point earlier it, it's a big fat hairy ass goal and it scared the life out of me you know, the furthest I've ever run is, is 50 mile, you know, and, you know, I remember standing on the start line, not knowing, you know, the furthest I'd run before that was a marathon at the back end of Ironman, you know, so, and before doing Ironman, I'd never run over half marathon, you know, so, um, so it was all, all these things were sort of, but I, I love that, I thrive in that, you know, they're not knowing, I've got no, I've got, like I said, I've got no appetite of repeating things I've done to go quicker or whatever, it doesn't, it's a waste, it's a waste of, 24 hours or whatever, you know, so, what, what, so I've done 100 mile, what, what's next really? Um, but again, the, the, the notion that I oh, can't do it, like lo lots of people, it was really interesting. So I think I had an awful lot of messages before and I didn't really realize the significance of it. It was a sort of flippant thing that I discussed with a guy who does some, some training programs for me and, you know, his reaction sort of told me, <laughs> You might have bitten off a bit more than you could chew, which is which is great. You know, that was just the sort of red rag I wanted. You know, and then and then it was probably all the all the messages I had in the run up to it were probably taught. <laughs> so, so lots of people saying, you know, good luck. You, I, I reckon you'll do it. You know, was, you know, you, you know the character you are. Right through to lots of people who sort of, are you sure? That, you know, we don't think don't think you can do it, and all, all that type of stuff. Which, which again, which is which is fine and great. You know, I, I don't, don't don't mind that. Um, but I think in reality, I was, I was never not going to finish. You know, it, it might not have looked, it might not have looked pretty, and it might have taken me all the sodding week. But you know, I was going to do, I was going to do hundred miles on a treadmill. You know, and I had in my mind that under twenty four hours was a, was a, would would be a, a good, a good, a good one. You know, I, I, I did some research online, and there's some, there's some recognised sort of. Um, events online called the dreadmill and stuff and they give competitors 20 40 hours to do it and stuff and then you know the more i read into it the sort of the 24 hour and the 24 hour mark was a was a respectable time for 100 miles so 
You were quite a bit under, well, say quite a bit, you were, was it 23? 22 and a half I was, half, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, so well, I will, again, I have got no, I've got no litmus test, or, you know, I've got no barometer to, 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 to sort of measure it against, but, you know, that was, that was the best I could do on the day, you know, I've yeah. had a crack at it, I, what, as, as, as sort of dull as I am, and as, you know, so laid back and sort of um, as people think I am, and I, I, those people who know me and know I don't overly do detail, and you know you'll know why that's texting back and forth to liaise with this, you know, it's to sort of fly by the seat of my pants. I, I still like to control what I can control, you know. So I knew all these events. Uh, there's three aspects to them: nutrition and hydration, your, your your mental aptitude, and your physical one. Well, mm. I firmly believe that you can get you can get two thirds of it right before you even st stand on the start line, you know, and that, that's my, I always try and make sure I get those two right. So I was meticulous with my sort of food and hydration. So I knew exactly what to do. So I sort of, I understand my body, you know, sport has taught me that, you know, I understand the concept of, you know, concepts around nutrition, hydration, and I've learned over, <laughs> certainly through trial and error as well, over the last few years around how to fuel the endurance side of it. So that was, that was really, that was really good. So at no point did I feel hungry, did I feel fatigued, did I cramp or anything like that, which meant that it was mm -hmm. just a physical challenge then between me and the treadmill, you know? Yeah. I mean, because... It's the mental aptitude that you mentioned. Oh, sorry, Finn, you go. Yeah, sorry, I'll come back to that one, Frank. I was just going to say about the nutrition bit, because uh, obviously... Okay. You know, we've had a lot of ultra runners on, on here, and you know, obviously we speak to a lot of them, and, and most you know weigh in at sort of eight stone nine stone um, <laughs> you know yeah. i mean you're, you're six foot five and you've i don't know 100 something kg uh you know it's a big it's a big frame to be moving for that length of time uh i mean you know eating wise you know were you eating proper meals did you did, did you yeah. give yourself like every 25 miles is going to be a uh, get off the treadmill, sit down, aid station, have a f meal, or how did you? No, so I, I did them. Um, so I, I'm I'm six six five and hundred and ten kgs, which is probably not conducive to long distance ultra <laughs> ultra distance running. But um, so I'm a bit of a handicap to start with. But um, you know, with, within that, I I've sort of I knew that I was going to be in the region of. 15,000 calories really somewhere between 15 and 17,000 calories for, for for the 24 hour period really based on you know that my heart rate data and stuff and I was sort of I knew that I wanted to stay somewhere around the 130 beats per minute because that, that's a sort of zone zone one zone two for me you know it meant that I, you know I'm pretty pretty confident that fueled and hydrated but I could and keep going indefinitely really you know at, at that at that level so that was that was the first thing. Um, you know, I did have the mindset that I was going to keep moving, or I was going to keep breaks to a real minimal. Um, you know, I have I've learned previously that I stiffen up pretty quick as well. You know, so um, I've done sort of multi-leg events, but never done sort of multi-day events, which would be my one of my my next challenges as well. But and I know that you know I recover quick, but I stiffen up quick, so I didn't want to didn't want that to creep in so um and I, I basically i started at one o'clock in the afternoon so i knew that i had to get my breakfast right so i was looking at sort of 1500 calories really some some point in the morning um and again sort of slow slow release and stuff to make sure that i was i was full and fueled I, obviously i started my hydration particularly about 72 hours before to make sure that that was i was properly hydrated um and likewise i made sure that what i didn't want is things like red meat and stuff in my system so you know i lightened my food if you like so fish and chicken and and i in the run-up in the run-up in the 48 hours before as well because i didn't want to feel bloated and clogged and and, and all that so that was that and you know lunch then was an, again another sort of 1200 calories but was sort of Again, good calories, so a sweet potato, mixed veg type type um, type meal. Um, I used um, name sports 
Meme Sport, the supplement group, and some PAS stuff throughout, you know. So, um, made sure that, so the first sort of 10, 12 hours, um, I was on a rotation of carb drink. Always had, always had water anyway, because I like, you know, like cleaning water, uh, like cleaning my mouth and stuff. So, I always had water. And then I, but I made sure throughout as well that I, I took mainly used gels for the first 10, 10 hours because I was full of food anyway, which was, was fine. Uh, at the eight hour mark, I had a meal. So I had noodles with, with some salmon and soy sauce because I quite like the salty, yeah, you know, and, and, and I do like real food. So I had intermittent um, meal replacement shakes as well, you know, to, to again get the calorie up. And I, and I also took amino acids throughout as well because, as, as you know, my, your body starts to break down once you, you know, in that zone for that, for that long. So almost starting the recovery process while you're, while you're still, still exercising. And then I had probably, um, I'd sort of two pick me up meals as well. I had the old trusty bacon sandwich at sort of 6am or 6.30am, no, sorry, 7am on Saturday morning. So, you know, when, when I was, I think I just, you know, I just started my fourth marathon then, you know, so I was just, that was a welcome relief and then I had another one then at sort of 10 30 for the last for the last hour um I had some bananas and um I had some caffeine um no, I used caffeine at that sort of 10 11 o'clock mark you know when you my natural biorhythms were dipping just to give me a pick me up so to get me over that sort of midnight and then again at about four o'clock onwards when you know again when it's that early hours it's dark house was quiet <laughs> and but then when, once the sun came up you know life got a life got a bit better then if you like and the end, the end was in sight so probably a couple of other things I, I i cleaned my teeth a few times which was you know again just to get rid of all that sugar and feel you do feel fresh um i didn't i didn't change my clothes which i you know i intended to but um, I was actually feeling pretty good, you know. I wasn't wasn't suffering with, you know, chafing or rubbing or anywhere. I I always wear two pairs of socks when I when I do these events. So I, I wear the um, really thin ingenie ones with a separate toes, and then I wear a wear a um, stance running sock over the top, you know, and the stand my body that way and I've never never touched wood never had problems with blisters or, or rubbing we're trainers that are size too big obviously the because we all know the, the, the swelling that way um and that was that was about it really I'm, I'm and I'm, I'm it's, it's really interesting I'm quite comfortable I didn't you know considering I was on the treadmill of 23 hours I probably watched two hours of telly and listened to a couple of hours of um of music but apart from that I, I really am quite comfortable living in that living in that space in my head which is you know something I've probably learned that not many people are you know it's, it's I'm quite I'm quite happy doing doing rounds with those with those demons if you like you know and having a wrestle and I mean on that note right you've mentioned the mental aptitude there and that's what fascinates me most both about your 100 mile treadmill um, and the the marathon in the garden because I mean, you mentioned Ironman 10 moves your first marathon, for example, but at least then you've got the mass crowds cheering you on. You've got a set target line. You've got the finish. You've got a time you've got to complete in. There's things there to G you up, and you've also got a different scene at every corner, you know, so, so it's original, so to speak. How, how do you get over the, the tedium, for want of a better word, of when you're on a treadmill the same way for, well, 22 and a half hours in your case, or when it comes to the Garden Marathon, doing the same route over and over and over and over again. It, it's, it's probably, there's probably a couple of things in here. So what, one is I know, relatively speaking, I know what tough is. So, you know, whether it be drawing on experiences from matches, whether it be in nervous, you know, walking around the stadium, whether it be going to Poland on training camps and, you know, whether it be scared at the start of some of these events not knowing whether you can complete it and completing it you know so you draw strength on on all this and I'm David Coggins is an interesting guy you know I know you will know him and I'm sure all your listeners will you know he talks around I mean cookies in the cookie jar you know and part of your training should be on callous in your mind and different things like that and although he's a crazy American and 
there's lots of swear words in it and it's over commercialized you know some of his principles i sort of can can relate to you know and i have a really interesting debate with a with a good mate of mine so he's a, he's um he's relatively new to activity if you like you know he's, he's been on that ironman journey and, it, and it's been incredible to watch you know he's he's lost four or five stone you know he, he just cut a cut off his first year took an hour off his second year this year he's looking to go sort of sub 14 you know and it's been fantastic to watch but one of my big discussion points of criticism with him is and and his circle if you like is they train comfy you know so they'll do it's all within within limits they all know what's coming it's done on Zwift you know and which is fine you know it's a process and you know and it works for them whereas I'm a bit different I you know I I like variety I like a challenge myself I like the unknown because for me that you draw strength from that you know, he like he 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 wants he's he's supposed to be doing Mallorca this year. The so so he wanted to fly out there and ride the bike course before, you know, because he needs to get confidence. For, whereas zero interest in doing that because a because of the cost, but b, <laughs> b you know for me the, the the challenge of not not knowing is 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 the stimulus I need to sort of attack it if you like. Um, I think the other thing I do is I don't hide away from the fact that it's going to be tough. So I, you know, I'm fully prepared going into these things, and I know, I know the EBGBs are coming, um, and you know you've got to, you've got to have a coping strategy for that. You know, you've got to. There's no point pretending they're not going to come because, and again, you don't know, you don't know when they're going to arrive. I've done, I've done stuff where they come in the first couple of hours. You know, we all have the, excuse my language, you can beat this out. The, the what the fuck am I doing? You know, we will, and you'd be lying if you didn't. You know, it's oh, what, and the, why am I doing this and. You, you have an answer to those or is, is, is really important. I think the other thing is that I do is a lot of people will, will talk around, you know, blocking pain out and all that. But I don't, don't buy into that notion at all. I, I think the best and mentally toughest people embrace it rather than try and block it out. So, you know, it's going to hurt and you've got to, you've got to, you've got to embrace that pain and discomfort and, and move on. And, and the other thing I've learned as well is, <laughs> is, what real pain is uh, I don't, don't don't mean that as in you know but I you can differentiate between oh this just hurts a lot and I'm really uncomfortable through to actually there's something seriously wrong you know and you know and, and, and being comfortable that you know the difference between the two allows you to push through the oh this just hurts a bit if that makes sense you know and I, you know it, it's not it's not about a pain threshold don't pretend to be tough I know I'm not tough at all you know I'm not tough than anyone else we just just have a different coping strategy to some you know and that's you know somewhere in all those things I, I get get through it you know again my Ironman journey was an interesting one so I've got it's only recently that I've really started Zwifting so again like I said for so, so, so for the, sort of for the, twice I've done it I've done 10 or 12 week training plans they are all been relatively you know no more than eight to ten hours a week all been high intensity you know, I'm quite comfortable sat on sat in my garage on my watt bike staring at the wall, hitting numbers. You know, I don't need to be entertained or stimulated, or you know, I don't go out, I don't go out for group rides and stuff. It's all a process, if you like, you know. But I draw strength on that. Then that come race day, that you know, I can I can live in that world, you know. Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the comments you made it just a moment ago. Uh, it's home with so many people who perhaps don't make their, you know, reach their goals or reach their potential is the train easy. I think that's a, that's a great sort of uh, saying is that, and we're all sort of uh, guilty of that. You know, you might go out and think, right, I'm going to do 10 hill reps and then you've done eight and you think, oh, that's enough for today. Or, or you know, you're on a swift bike and you, you know, you drop down the gears and you think I'll just take it easy because, you know, that's uh, such a such a thing as that you know it is was it the old well the SAS saying isn't it was it uh, uh, train hard, train fight, hard easy. fight easy yeah so uh, but uh, you know on that as well just you know, obviously you're captain of Wales you know and you've got you know leadership qualities which are you know you've captain both sides there you've got and and I'd imagine you know when you're in a changing room or building up to a big test match or any any game. You've got so many things going on in your mind and you're looking after other people or you've got to speak to people or you feel like 
you've got to be a focal point in the change room because you're the captain, you've got to speak to the ref, you've got to do this. When it comes to these events then, you know, and, and not, not, so, not even the ones you've done in lockdown, but, you know, I know you've done, I think you did the Brecon 50 or something like that, and you're standing on the, on the start line and it's just you and you've got nothing else to worry about. I mean, there's two contrasting worlds there. Yeah. Do you, do you uh, enjoy one more than the other or, or what's your take on it? Um, no, it, it is interesting. I tell you what's interesting is I, 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 I'm quite comfortable being in a crowd on my own. So when I do cycle with the boys, I, I've, got, I've got a mate of mine who is a fiercely social animal, right? You know, and I drive him nuts. We'll go out on the bikes and I don't want to talk and I'll quite openly tell him to shut up because I don't want to. But I, but I enjoy his company and I enjoy riding in a in a park or whatever. But I just don't want to talk, you know, because again, it's, and, I'm, and I'm trying to teach myself to enjoy some of it as well because I'm still in that. Everything's a process. Everything's a training session. Everything's, you know, and I'm trying to say that actually coffee and cake on a bike ride's okay, you know, and taking three hours rather than an hour and a half is okay. And I've got to learn. To, I've got to learn to dial it down and enjoy it a bit, you know, as well. And I don't have to race everything all the time, and I don't have to. So, um, you know, the changing room is an interesting one. You, you, and again, it's probably not dissimilar to some of these events. You've got, you've got a huge cross section of society in the changing room. You know, all people with. All different upbringings and backgrounds and journeys and, and stories to tell and that's no different to a start line you know you stand on the start line you've got everyone from those that are going to pb and right through to those that are doing charity and you know that is that is their everest it might be the, the pinnacle of their uh, you know their world and that's great as well and you know? I, I enjoy all that right but i also enjoy i enjoy the fact it is different you know something i something i really do enjoy around the endurance world if you like is you know, I genuinely believe everyone's supportive of each other, you know, and you know, the, the notion that unless you win it, everyone gets the same medal, I think it's a fantastic one, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't had one bad experience, really, of, of, of an event where people haven't been helpful, support, you know, I'm talking about competitors, you know, or, you know, participants now who aren't competitive, supportive, giving of their time, knowledge, info. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's, I think that's I think that's fun I think that's I think that's really fantastic um you know comparing it to it undoubtedly there's the emotions that you get stood on a start line staring down the barrel of something you don't know how it's going to go is not dissimilar to standing on the 15 meter line singing the anthem because you know you, you you're gonna you're gonna test your body I suppose the major difference is not 75,000 people or three million people at home who could do it better than you. <laughs> probably, it probably is, but um, anyway, I suppose with it, it, it's it's you for you. But given the nature of who I am, mm. you know, I always give my best in that world, and I always give my best right now in 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 this world. You know, I suppose. Yeah. Did uh, you say that you obviously uh, people, everyone could do it better than you? And there's, I mean, I don't think there's anything in in Wales more so than. When Six Nations weekend is on, everyone is an expert on rugby, and everyone has got their opinion. Did that ever bother you? Any, you know, you getting the knocks, or, um, uh, or, or do you not listen to it? Or I think you, yeah. I think you, you'd be lying if you said you don't listen because you, you are aware of it. Because even if you don't read the papers, your your parents do, your friends do. You know, social media follows you into your home these days, doesn't it? You know, so you you can't get away from it. Um, again, you've you've got to. Again, and social media was a new phenomenon when I when I played, and you know, I probably struggled with that um, late, later on in my career. But it, it's understanding where it comes from. I suppose it is an element that it comes with the territory. But I think something that we've got to remember at times is these are just boys and girls who are good at sport. You know, they're not just because just because they're good at rugby and we put a microphone in their face. You know, we, our expectation of them is is. Mm. It's incredible, you know, and you expect them to say the right things and behave the right way and with relatively little or no support. But, you know, did it? Yeah, then undoubtedly there were, there were periods where it, it, it gets to you. But again, you, you take it for what it is. I suppose you'd be naive to think that, you know, if you're Captain Wales, people wouldn't have an opinion or a thought, you know. But the reality is there's still only, what was it, 1,500 people who've ever played for Wales, you know. So pretty, pretty select bunch. And... I wouldn't swap it for the world, you know. There, there's certain things that 
your time never became your own and you're never anonymous and different things like that. But that's, you know, that's, that's the, that's the price you pay, I suppose. Did that, uh, I mean, you know, and you, you talk about the events that, like, you know, like the hundred mile on the treadmill and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, you get a text off someone saying you can't do that. I mean, in the same way as, you know, with, with the internationals maybe, yeah. and then, you know, people knocking you, did they spur you on more? Is that what, you know, drives people who get to the top level of things or do extraordinary things? Is it the willingness to prove, is it about proving people wrong or proving yourself right? Or, or doesn't it come down to that? Or is it just the competitiveness in you anyway? Yeah, oh, it's interesting. Or all and none of it, I suppose. Finn. I suppose like it's, it's a strange one. You know, and, and undoubtedly we're driven. You know, I was certainly driven to be the best I could be. You know, probably first and foremost. Um, you know, I certainly never went out to do anything but hundred uh, percent. Give my give my everything. Um, mm-hmm. Some things it went well, and some things didn't go so well. Um, undoubtedly, you, you know, you want to prove people wrong, as it, as it were. You can, you know, you have one bad game, you want to right the wrong, don't you? You know, and different things or. You know, certain things stick in your mind, but um, you know, I, I just I just believe that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And you know, I was just an ordinary guy who just happened to be in the right place at the right time and half decent at rugby. You know, so um, I just think you know we, we do we do well to remember that of, of each other at times as well. You know, I, I do. I think I think it's. I, I think you know. I think growing growing up as 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 how I wish I knew now. What I, I wish I knew then. What I know now, you know, undoubtedly, and I wish I had the outlook I've got now then. But that's that's hindsight, isn't it? You know, I probably would have coped with things a little differently and maybe done a few a few other different things. But you know, that that's that, that's yeah, life. I I suppose. Mm. I mean, like Fraser's got his uh, his little one. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> But I, I, I just give you a question. No, I, I actually have a question for Ryan from that. Actually, um, you you said you wish you you could see things then how you see them now, and you're speaking today with, with great clarity and with with some very sensible perspective, to be honest. But throughout your rugby career, in particular, was it hard to have that perspective at the time? You had the highs, you had the lows. You had, as Finch mentioned, the three Grand Slams, the the Lions Tour um, in 2005, which ultimately turned out very well for you, but from a Lions team point of view, it had a pretty disastrous test series. You had the, the World Cup that got away, so to speak, with Wales in 2011. Did, were you able to retain a sense of perspective then, or were you living in the moment, and was it very much a sense of, in the euphoric moment, this is brilliant, this is everything, and this is the end of the world when you miss out? Yeah, probably. Because we've spoken at Sean Holly, we should mention the Ospreys as well success there but obviously countered with, with the European disappointments which uh, he's not over I can tell <laughs> and it's, it's, it's probably both you know there were undoubtedly moments where you know I thought this was, was the best thing in the world and it was going to last forever you know and that's what young you know when, you, when you're a young man travelling the world and you, you're playing relatively well and everyone's saying nice things about you and you know that, that that's what it's like um, I think but within that as well, and undoubtedly, you know, you do go to euphoric highs and you go to pretty, pretty big lows as well. And I suppose my sort of career was littered with that, you know, whether it be injury versus, you know, relative success or um, whether it be dips in form to gaining the capacity to losing it, you know. And But that's my, that's probably my journey. I think one of the, you know, and one of the things I, you know, I would go back and tell my younger self is, Try not to go to the euphoric highs quite as high, and try not to go quite as low. You know, you've you've got all this noise going on around you. You've got to try and you know retain some level of normality throughout it, as as, as difficult as that is. Because you know, here I am, five years post retiring, and I'm just a footnote in the story. You know, it doesn't none of it really matters now. You know, and that's that's that, that's the nature of pro sport. You know, I was a I was a sort of commodity that contributed everything that I could did my bit but again the, the stories moved and you know I'm old news you know I'm I'm remembered by mums and nans you know not <laughs> not wives and daughters you know that's the that's yeah. the that's, that's the reality but uh, I mean 
we were talking, uh, <clears throat> Fraser mentioned Sean there. I, I've heard Sean speak before and he was asked a question about leadership and about uh, uh, resilience and, and your name popped up. You know, he, you know, he, he named you, he said like, you know, that you were a 100% you know, example of what a leader should be and then your resilience as well within the game and, and what you brought to the squad. You know, I mean, that thing of leadership, you know, what, what, what do you put that down to? What, what, what's your sort of nugget on being a good leader? Or Yeah, it's, leadership's, a, leadership's a really interesting one. So, you know, if, if there was an answer to that question, there'd be one book in Waterstones, wouldn't there? Not every Tom, Dick or Harry who's ever had a title of leadership would have, would have written one. Um, you know, for, for me, it, it, there's probably a few things. I, th I think the best leaders are authentic, you know. I think one thing a pro sport does is... It, it can be a pretty vulnerable place, you know. You can be you can be exposed pretty quickly in a changing room um, under extreme pressure. So, you know, I, I do think there's being authentic is really important. I think communications is a, is a key one. You know, you have to be you have to be able to communicate in, in a whole raft of ways with a whole different different sectors of society. You know, whether it be media, royalty players in a changing room, coach is, you know, the list goes on and on and on. I think, I think communication is, is, is important. I think, I think you've, you've, honesty is an interesting one. So, um, you don't become honest just because you park your car in the car park and walk into a, a building and, and join a team, you know, you, it goes, it's linked to that authentic, authenticity piece. Just, just be honest and be, be you. I, I think that's the one thing that you can sort of hold your, hold your head up high then you know you, you don't try don't try and certainly don't try and mimic someone else you know just because martin johnson and gareth thomas were good captains a certain way doesn't mean to say that you know that's that's your way um i think you you, you, you need you need to be able to cope you know coping strategy for a captain is really important or leader you know so you need you need some some form of escape um i think you've got to lead by example you know whatever your example is you know you i think you've got to be You've got to be authentic to that. So you know, there's 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 lots there's lots in there, and I, and I speak speak a lot lot on this um, because there's there's a whole there's different ways of leading in success and under pressure, you know, in under failure. I think I think good leaders are emotionally intelligent as well. I think that's I think that's that's an important attribute to have because you have to understand you have to understand people. Um, so it, it, circumstance, you know, often drive the type type of leader that you need to need to be. Um, so in answer to your question, I don't, I don't 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 think there is. I don't think there is one thing. I, and I do also think that we all we all lead to a greater or lesser extent as well. You know, um, yeah. we all go <coughs> is it? Team, right? <coughs> do, do you do you have to be though? I mean, can you still be one of the boys, so to speak, in the in the sporting environment in the team? And or do you have to keep a little bit of a distance? Um, well, again, it, it depends on what what type of what type of leader you are, your network, and you know. I think um, you know they, 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 they you know they, they, the colleagues and um, that, you, that you that you work with really. You know, and there's an awful lot of people out there to share share a beer with and shared some fantastic experiences with. You know, mm -hmm. but. You know, lives and, and different things go different ways. So you've got to be you've got to be authentic to you. I think you know it is a team sport, isn't it? You know, and you you do share some fantastic mm. experiences and, and memories. So undoubtedly, you're, you you know you're part of that unit. Um, but everyone's part of it to a greater or lesser extent, depending on team dynamics, personalities within that group. You know, that'll largely dictate you know whether you're part of the boys or not, or or, di or, dif or different things. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I just want to just move on from that again. Obviously, we, we, we just got sidetracked a little bit from your uh, gardening, uh, <laughs> garden and house challenges. But massive important thing with that, obviously, doing it to challenge yourself and, you know, and to inspire people. But there was a charity element to it as well. And the, the sums raised were phenomenal. I, I, I mean, I don't know what it's at now, but... Uh, where are yeah. we with that? And I think the, the, the primary, the primary cause. So, so to take you back a bit, so it, it came about after the first sort of week of lockdown. Um, 
I sat there having, having lunch at the kitchen table and sort of reading and about all the stuff that the frontline workers were doing. I just think, you know, I was blown away by the human spirit, you know, in, in a period of sort of unprecedented, which seems to be the, <laughs> the most common <laughs> term in the world right now, is a yeah. uh, time, you know, certainly that our generation will, will see, I'm sure. You know, the, the power of the human spirit to go above and beyond for others is, just blew me away. And I'm, I'm sat here, as everyone else does, I'm in my lunch at my kitchen table, away from work, probably in a bubble, you know nothing's really affecting me right now thinking well what could i do to contribute you know how can i support how can i help and i was uh, and just coincidentally i was reading around um the local uh nhs trust were trying to raise funds for sort of uh non-medical care so it was all stuff for whether it be ppe through to sort of health and well-being of patients so the, the swansea bay and and neath talbot trust were looking to raise money i thought well Crikey, probably the one thing I can do is is raise the profile a little bit and, and, and raise some money. So I sort of reinstigated my social media accounts and I was, and all this was done whilst looking at the garden. And I was thinking, well, you know, I could be in this for a while. I was due to go for a run that afternoon. I thought, well, it just snowballed. I thought, well, how far is a marathon in the garden? Seven, well, okay, why? And I thought, oh, don't be so stupid, you know. But then again, that's a self-limited belief. So I thought, well, no, come on, let's give it a go. And that, that was it, you know, and I set myself a sort of what now seems like a modest target of a thousand pounds to raise because I thought, you know, if other people on the back of it sort of raise, raise some money for the trust, it would be, be a good thing. And sort of eight and a half thousand pounds later, that, you know, that challenge had sort of gone. And, and I, I enjoyed the whole sort of process, I enjoyed the challenge of it, I enjoyed the sort of engagement with people. And then as soon as I finished, undoubtedly, sort of people started saying, well, what's next, what's next, you know? And then then, then the, the, the 100 mile on the turbo came up. Um, and then following that, we did a, a which which was phenomenal. You know, we raised sort of, uh, crikey, somewhere in the region of 38,000 on that 100 miler. Um, and then again, there was a lot next. So I thought, well, you know, trying to make it as inclusive as I can, so just sponsored one mile, so families and different things, because you know, our nurses and medical staff work mi walk miles and miles and miles after doing each shift. So lots of people got involved in that. And then I thought, you know, and, and at this time as well, lot, lots of other people's fundraising. You know, I was fully conscious that, you know, people are under an awful lot of sort of financial pressure and, and like as well. So I didn't want to keep asking people to donate etc that's not what it was about but and I thought well you know that was a, that was a quiet week because in the back of my mind they had the 100 miler you know and that was that was sort of my final final challenge really as a, sort of others took at the mantle so we've just really we've raised just over 55,000 now I think in the in the course of three and a half weeks which was I've been blown away by actually yeah. been, I mean you back. must be so sort of really impressed with that and really sort of <laughs> pleased with yourself yeah, yeah, really pleased, you know, chuffed the bits, you know, because it genuinely will make a difference. You know, the last yeah. 100 miler was to raise money, particularly around one one cause, was, was they're trying to produce, trying to um, make safe rooms, if you like, you know, in, in hospitals for, for for nurses and, and patients alike to go to. The, they have a, they're calling them wobble rooms. So, you know, when they look after their own mental health, so you know, trying to make them calm spaces and, comfortable so you know people can go and, and get some space and, and recharge the batteries a bit so that you know that was i thought you know i thought that was a fantastic cause and you know again i think the 100 mile race somewhere in the region of, of eight eight thousand as well so that will go to, the, to, to that so then yeah, ryan uh, what uh, obviously you know go back to the, the charity and you've you know that's that's a phenomenal amount of money you know, and something uh Something that really, uh, you know, if, if it was me personally, would be up there with achievements of, of anything you've done, like, you know, to raise that sort of money and, and to galvanise all those people that you have galvanised in this lockdown period, you know, to get on, on the bikes and do 100 milers like we did or to, to run a mile, whatever they did, but also, you know, to, to dig deep and, uh, and support you. That's, uh, that's yeah, you know, and... And you obviously explaining what it's for and you know it's such an important thing in the in the nhs or any sort of uh, first line workers at the moment you know the ones who are you know we're sitting around trying to find things to do uh 
you know, they're out there working hard and it's, it's the anxiety of what they're facing really is, uh, is, is a massive thing. I, I know quite a few people in the NHS who, and they are saying it's, it's the anxiety of the working at the moment, which is really getting to them. So, so I can only sort of uh, say, you know, it's awesome really. Yeah, no, th and thanks. I, like I said, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm blown away by everyone's, everyone's support of me as well, you know, because again, a lot of these ideas were, were, were you know, were, were, were my concepts, if you like, that, that people bought into. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. I'm blown away by people's generosity. You know, I, I always am. And I'm, and I'm bored, you know, or overwhelmed by, you know, seeing what those frontline workers are doing, you know, because it's, it's not just them, it's the, it's the sacrifice to their family and friends and, and the like as well, you know, and I, I think if nothing else, I, you know, I hope society's in, in a strange way better for it after, you know, that we do, we do understand that, you know, the, the NHS is a wonderful institution that we should all do our best to, best to protect and, you know, as and where possible, we should, we should say thank you. I, I tell you what really did move me over the last f f four weeks is, um, during the marathon, actually, a, a, a lady knock, knocked the door. Um, and uh, a lady from the village. You know, we didn't know her. I didn't, didn't recognise her. And she she just come to say she was a, she was a nurse, and she just come to see say she heard what we were doing, and she just wanted to say thank you. And with that, she left. And you know, I haven't seen her since. All that, and that that was a that was quite a touching touching moment, really, you know. So I sort of realised then that you know it was it was a good it was a good thing and the right and the right thing to do, you know. So I'm I'm I am pleased pleased about you know really personally pleased about that yeah yeah that's great so once we come out of this <clears throat> what is the uh i mean we haven't even touched on uh and I, obviously you're gonna have a lot to do with work wise when we come out of this I, i'd imagine yeah. uh yeah but, but you know what, what what do you see the the future for ryan jones uh coming well, I, out of this well, I, and where we go well, with it? A little, little bit. I, I struggle a little bit um, in the fact that with, with training, although I've committed to it, I've the convenience of the fridge and all that as as an help. So I <laughs> probably haven't I haven't lost the weight that I'd hoped to. Um, conflicting in and out of you know diet for three days and then barbecue for two. You know, is that like of, <laughs> that type of cycle at the moment? Um, and uh, so I'm a bit disappointed that way. But training has gone okay, you know. So I've, I've struggling with my shin. Post the post the run, so it's what two weeks now, and I, I've had some sort of um, stress reaction in my in my in my shin to the in in the bone. So I've got a huge amount of swelling and stuff. So running's going to be off the cards for a while. But I'm, I'm two days back cycling now, so I'm going to get into that. Um, you know, I I don't think I a man will go ahead in September due to the you know what the world may look like, but it it, it may. Um, that being said, I'm going to continue. I I think. What it has shown me is that I'm gonna gonna invest some time and effort in, into looking at a few different challenges, albeit if I, I run them myself logistically. And because again, I think, what, as I said, these the, the, it's my story, you know, and I, I quite enjoy it. And if I can inspire and hook some people along the way, that'd be fantastic. And I'm looking at a few different projects and partners now to do to do a couple of things, whether that be the back end of this year. If I can drop some weight and get fit enough for early part next year, that'll, that'll keep me sane and something to look forward to. But um, you know, I want to get my first and foremost, I'll get myself to, to a position where I'm fit enough that you know, with a sort of eight, ten week swing either way, I can do largely whatever I fa fancy in that in that um, in that endurance world. Really. A final question from me, Ryan, before, before we start to wrap things up. Here, obviously, every I mean. It's been well documented. Every sport faces challenges coming out of this. You know, there's going to be difficult times ahead. We all recognise that. But to, I think we, we've analysed them over on different platforms to death in the last few weeks. To a slightly different, more positive take on it. And oh, this is something that's relevant to you with your, your role in WIU and the participation of, of rugby, but to all sports as well. Could one positive be now that this lockdown has forced people to appreciate being active more, appreciate exercise more, and could that have a knock-on effect to things like rugby? The people who may youngsters or seniors who may be half-hearted in it, but now realise what life is like when it's gone. Yeah, well, and we, we don't know is the, is the honest answer. So yeah. undoubtedly, there's going to be you know we think there may be behavioural change out of it. You know, so there's lots of 
lots of different institutes looking at what they could possibly be. Undoubtedly, I think we'll value human interaction <laughs> again, you know, and yeah. so, sort of sport is a, is a wonderful way to in, interact with, with other people. Um, but that flies in the face of what, you know, what could be mass gatherings and, and things like that, you know, again, there's a big question mark over what mass participation sport looks like going forward. So like the events you run, Finn, you know, how, how practical is that going to be going forward in the, in the short term? But I definitely think we, you know, one of the real positive legacies of this could be the, the value put on activity, exercise and, and outdoors, you know, so I'd certainly like to see if, if, if nothing else continues that we, we're a nation of, I actually more people run and cycle past the house than I've ever had, you know, and yeah, keeping that but but again we we may fall back into old habits pretty quick and uh, as well so um again i i i, I don't I really don't know um but again you you hope that one of the positives is we, we value the simple things in life and one of those is sport and activity and and, and everything that goes with it yeah <clears throat> it'll be interesting to see when things like uh, the prince of Alti stadium will be full again and you know and and all that sort of things, like you know, it's uh, we just don't know, do we? No, we don't, yeah. you know. No. So we're all waiting with bated breath, my friend. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just before uh, we do sort of finish, is there? Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you, right? It's uh, <clears throat> you know, thank you for uh, for your time and everything. But anything you want to add? No, no, not not really. <coughs> I get it. I get it. I hope everyone's enjoyed listening. Um, you know, we could have touched on any one of those subjects in yeah. far more, far more detail. So, I suppose um, if if there is an appetite from listeners out there that do hear more about any one aspect of it, maybe we can look at that again at some point in the future. But thanks, thanks you both for for taking the time and listening. We warble on for. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, well, I, I was, that's what I was saying to Fraser. I said there's so many different topics here. Like, I mean, you know, your varied sort of sporting you know rugby career you know you could talk for hours and days on that and and then since what you've done since and you know and everything else so uh so yeah it's very much a whistle stop tour of it all but before Brilliant. we do finish uh we always do a lockdown lowdown so I ask a couple of questions and you have to pick one or the other right yeah okay. uh just uh n nothing too uh not nothing too taxing or too revealing uh, so if you're in the lockdown, social media or TV, and you have to give one of them up for, for three weeks. Oh, I give up social media, no problem. Yeah, you, you're not big on social media, are you? No, <laughs> uh, turbo trainer or treadmill? Turbo. Well, you... I, I, I quite happily never see a treadmill ever again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was going to say, right, you know, when you come out then, an epic bike ride adventure or an epic run adventure? Oh, epic run. Yeah. You'd, you'd keep the, the turbo, but you'd go for the run in the real life. I, I do love my, I've, I'm very fortunate. I, I, my, my retirement present myself was a Watt bike and it's probably the single best thing I ever bought. You know, I, I wish I bought one earlier, but I, I, do, I do love my Watt bike. <laughs> if you were... Uh, Everest or the South Pole? Everest. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. And uh, as a personal thing, then, as, as yourself, a captain or just a player? <laughs> uh, just a player now. Yeah. Yeah. Quite happy. <laughs> Quite happy to follow for a bit now. <laughs> That's brilliant. Hey, well, hopefully we will uh, get a chance to, to speak to you again soon. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see you down uh, down west and uh, we can get in the water and do uh, do some yeah. uh, co-steering and stuff like that. I, I, I just wanted to say that, actually, before we finish. You know, phrase. there's not many people that sort of you meet that, you know, when you're in their presence, you know that they are so confident, but in a good way. And, and you know, taking Ryan co-steering... Uh, you know, when you've got to lead people, like he, he wants to lead it, you know, as soon as we get in the water, right, we'll do this, we'll do that. You want to go higher, you want to jump higher. <laughs> Sometimes it's a case of, you know, 
uh, right, right, yeah, well, yeah, well, I, would, I would jump off that cliff, but my insurance uh, won't quite let me. Like, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I think your, your original ethos, wasn't it, of, of, um, was, of muck adventures was overcome your limits, wasn't it? So that ties into a, a lot of what Ryan's spoken about in this last uh, this last hour or so, so that would fit, to be fair, Finn. It would, yeah. We, uh, we I, love, I, love, I love that. I do love that. That's a, that's a great mantra, that is, overcome your limits, because, <laughs> again, you know, I just encourage people to not live by other people's limitations and stuff as well. You know, the, the limit, the limits, the limits we have are the only ones we set ourselves, you know, and I just encourage people that don't, don't be, don't be driven by a fear of failure, you know, just go for it. You know, you'll learn more, you'll always learn more by from failure than you ever will by, by success. And, you know, just keep, keep pushing and nudging because trust me, you know, when you discover what you're capable of, you know, it just opens up more and more avenues. It's a fantastic place to be. And I think that is a good note to end it on. <laughs> it's a great take to finish on, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ryan, take care of yourself, mate. Hey, Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I will catch you Thanks soon. Thanks so much. Be safe. Bye. Bye. Cheers, mate. Bye.